Security can still be a bit of a mystery to people who are new to app development. Most consider it important, but a surprising number of people are actively developing applications and they don't really know what the cornerstones of security are, which aspects you can take for granted and which you must be actively involved with. In this short video, I will take you through the high level concepts. After that, you'll know which ones are worth a deep dive and which ones are just taken care of for you in the background. Now, I won't belabor the first point because it's so basic, but I have to mention it because so many people still don't have good habits. You know who you are. Don't share passwords, don't reuse passwords, and actually don't use passwords. I'm just talking here about your Flutterflow account, your Google account, your Superbase, your Buildship, your App Store Connect, Stripe, Analytics, etc. These days there are so many accounts and if you use the same password for each of them, then you have one gigantic gaping security flaw. All that has to happen is that you sign up to a compromised website with some throwaway account that you think doesn't matter. But now that same email password combo is out there and all of your platforms are compromised. Definitely don't share passwords with team members. All the platforms that you'll use in app development have collaborator features. And there are none that I use that charge you for those features. If you insist on using password authentication for these sites, you must use a password manager like LastPass or 1Password, generate or auto-generate super strong passwords that you don't need to memorize for each platform, and then keep the password manager access bulletproof so you can centralize your attention. Then get multi-factor authentication. Google Authenticator is great and all of the big platforms support MFA, usually with Google Authenticator. And then you prioritize MFA on your Google account and your password manager account, and that's definitely non-negotiable. Phone number auth is not as good these days, really, because you still hear stories of idiot phone store clerks handing out and redistributing lost phone numbers without due diligence. And so attackers do still target them. But when I say don't use a password at all, what I mean is that my recommendation is actually to just use social auth, like sign in with Google for everything. Then you enforce strict MFA on your Google account, use a strong password for that, and that or your password manager are the only real attack vectors. Personally, I like to memorize my Google password as well, just in case I ever had trouble getting back into my password manager, but make sure that your Google password is super strong. At the very least, eight characters, ideally more. Same for your password manager's master password. Mine is absurdly convoluted, but it's also kind of a passphrase, so I can still memorize it using a mnemonic. Okay, now that the obvious stuff is out of the way, let's talk about your app itself. You've probably heard of authentication and authorization, commonly referred to as auth. When users log into your app, a provider like Firebase Auth will receive an API request that includes their social credentials or their password and email combo and respond with an access token known as a JWT. The app will store that token locally on their device where it will live for about an hour before it expires. And that's what authentication is. Authorization is the process of attaching that same token to every request that gets sent to the backend. That means that after login, the app doesn't communicate with Firebase at all anymore until it's time to refresh the token by authenticating again. So during that hour, the security is stamped into the token by design. In Flutterflow test mode, you can actually see the token being attached as a header to every request, and that will be decoded by your backend. You can send the Firebase auth token to any backend that's authorized to read a Firebase auth token, like Firestore, Superbase, or even your own custom backend if you want. The token itself actually contains a payload with details like the user's email and UID, and you can use that information directly when you're querying your database. Which brings me to database security. That's security at the database level. Database security depends obviously on what database you're using. So I'll just show you the most relevant examples. Superbase is a SQL database and it uses a ridiculously awesome technology known as row level security. RLS isn't a Superbase thing. It's actually a PostgreSQL thing. That's the cool thing about Superbase, by the way. PostgreSQL is ridiculously mature and established and it's also open source. So you can migrate away from Superbase, but keep your Postgres instance if you want to. Anyway, RLS is one of those things that you set up yourself. And the reason that it's not taken care of for you is because it depends on your app logic. It's up to you exactly how you want your app and therefore your security to behave. If you turn it off, then the data comes through and you might be tempted to leave it at that. But what you're actually doing is unlocking the gates to that data table and walking away. If I were an attacker targeting your app, 
it is trivial for me to find your URL and your anon key from any request that your app makes to the back end. And that information is totally public. Once I have those details, I can just take the anon key and set this into the headers of any request to the Superbase URL that I want to attack. This example is just a read request to data that I shouldn't be allowed to see. But with no RLS, I could update and delete data too, anything. I could nuke the whole table with one command. And literally anyone with a laptop anywhere in the world can do this. That's another reason to always back up your data. But if you have no security, then backing up your data seems kind of like a secondary concern anyway, right? Anyway, if you turn on RLS, you explicitly set the policies. So in this example, I can tell Superbase to dig out the UID of the user making the request and match it only to the rows in the table that that user originally created. Firebase has a similar security feature called Firebase Rules, where again, the information in the token gets matched to one of the fields in the collections. Firebase Rules isn't quite as sophisticated as RLS, but conceptually, it's very similar. Now, a lot of people ask me about data encryption. There are two principal components to data encryption. And obviously we're talking about the essentials here relevant to Flutterflow users. Cybersecurity is a huge and complex industry, but mainly we have encryption in transit and encryption at rest. You can just think of encryption in transit as SSL, more correctly, TLS. It's just HTTPS. And this is taken care of by your backend service. Even for custom backends, it's really not hard to set up for free using platforms like Let's Encrypt. Bottom line is that knowing that you need to have it is enough. Chances are you won't see normal HTTP without HTTPS out in the wild these days anyway. Encryption at rest means that your data isn't stored on the server as plain text. So if an attacker somehow gained access to your server, your data would be useless to them without the encryption keys. But the BAS platforms like Superbase and Firebase, they do encryption at rest automatically. So if you're using one of these providers, then just like with SSL, you don't really need to think about this. It just happens. Finally, there's API keys. This is an important topic and like with database level security, you need to be actively involved with it. We tend to use various third party services via API in modern applications, and you'll probably encounter the need to use API keys. An API allows the code in one external service to talk to another, and an API key is what authenticates that transaction and identifies what user account is making those requests. You can't ever place an API key directly into Flutterflow because Flutterflow generates code that lives on each user's device, and you must never try trust your users. So the only place that an API key is allowed to live is on a server. And by the way, even code bases that run on servers only need to see API keys at runtime. So you must never hard code API keys into your code. Incidentally, AI generated code does this all the time. And you can end up with cloud bills of tens of thousands of dollars because you didn't scrutinize the code that it gives you. If you don't believe me, search on Reddit for something like huge cloud bill API key. So API keys should live as environment variables or better yet as dedicated secrets. And all major cloud platforms will have some kind of system for secret management. And if you're interested how you might dig an API key out of an application bundle, have a look at this video next.